Hi, it's Steve Harkitan, and we are midway through the first day of the School Leadership Summit. This has really been fun, and we we actually have a day and a half this year, a day and a half plus an evening before. So uh, our The 2014 School Leadership Summit is sponsored by TCAL. They have been our founding sponsor. Many thanks to them. I think uh, Roland and Jason in the room. Hi, it's Steve Heikigan, and we are midway to the first day of the School Leadership Summit. This has really been fun, and we we actually have a day and a half this year, a day and a half plus an evening before. So, uh, our Special thanks to Scott McLeod, Dr. Scott McLeod, for being our midday keynote. Welcome, Scott. We're sure glad that you are here. The 2014 School Leadership Summit is sponsored by TCAL. They have been our founding sponsor. Many thanks to them. I think uh, Roland and Jason in the room, they are greatly appreciated. Thanks to AXA this year for sponsoring a strand of the conference and to Larry Wilson at Wilson Consulting for his continued support. This is your chance, those of you participating, to indicate where you are in the world. Look to the left of the map, look for the star icon, click on it twice, and then click on the map. I'm in North Carolina, where we continue to have vacillating, freezing to warm weather, snow earlier this week. School, late school starts, I think two days already. Oh, well, looks like we have Europe and Africa lovely. Please okay. keep posting so, on the chat. So rock and roll here. Um, so I'm, I'm the director of innovation for so Fairy Lake posting ADA. Posting on where you're participating right here in Iowa. So like ADA is the regional list service agency. We're in charge of about anyway, Scott, um, I would have to say that 45 school districts and another dozen or so private schools. We cover geographic areas about New Jersey. Thanks so much for being a leadership professor. And I do a bunch of stuff. I'm going to get you to do your celebration in the back where I talk to people about me. Um, so I'm just going to kind of get started right away. We've got a lot to see and talk about today, and um, I'm going to start by noting that this is not a like rah rah rally the troops keynote. Um, instead, this is a very nuts and bolts behind the scenes peek behind the curtain kind of presentation. So you're forewarned now, and uh, of course you're welcome to leave at any time. What I'm saying doesn't resonate with your needs. Um, but I thought I would share a little bit about how uh, some of the recent work that I've been doing with districts and with school leaders and how we really sort of walk people step by step through some really important processes. So I'll try and monitor the chat area as we go along. Feel free to interrupt at any time, and I'll also pause and, and take questions um, in between what I do. So I'm going to start by just um, talking about this issue around better tech integration. We know that most teachers and most administrators uh, don't have really robust visions of what powerful tech integration looks like. And to be honest, most of the models that are out there aren't very helpful. So you know, if you think about the TPAC uh, model that's out there, um, that uh, although it's a nice mental framework, it doesn't really help you diagnose the teacher and student's use of tools in the classroom. In fact, if you just took the TBAC model and explained it to a teacher, and then you said, okay, so now walk into some other teacher's classroom and, and tell me whether or not the tech integration is any good for that project they did with kids. TBAC doesn't really give you any very concrete anchors or any solid look for us. Um, so TPAC, although it's a nice model, uh, and I like when you use it a lot, um, it's not super helpful for sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, observation and evaluation. We have other frameworks that are supposed to help, like the SAMR model. Um, the challenge with the SAMR model for me personally is that uh, I haven't found anybody yet other than uh, Ruben himself who can really clearly articulate the differences between those two middle categories. And depending on who you ask, uh, you know, a particular task or use of technology floats between all those different categories quite easily. So somebody will say it's substitution, somebody else will say it's augmentation, somebody else will say it's modification. 
Um, those lines seem to be pretty blurry. And in my head, if, if I'm using a text framework, I want to have some pretty clear delineation so I know exactly where I am and, and so that a, a tech a knowledgeable teacher or administrator has, some, again, some concrete look for that will help them say, this is the category that I'm in. And, and again, I don't think Scammer comes with that, at least not to the level that I'm looking for. Um, so, um, you know, there's other things floating around out there, like Bloom's Digital Taxonomy, which tries to attach uh, general uses of text tools with, um, you know, the different Bloom's categories and the, and the different Bloom's levels. Um, you know, of course, whoops, of course the challenge with the Bloom's uh, digital taxonomy is that those tools that are over on the right hand side, um, you know, aren't in and of themselves, um, they don't have the Bloom's level embedded within them. So, for example, just because you're doing podcasting or, or filming, for example, um, which is supposedly in the creating block of, uh, area, you know, you can you very easily imagine how you could do those things at lower levels of Bloom's, right? And simultaneously, if you were social networking or, or bookmarking, that you can imagine how you could use those things in ways that were higher up on Bloom's than simply the remembering category. So they, they don't embed Bloom's in and of themselves. Um, we looked at the Arizona Tech Integration Matrix, which some of you might be familiar with, um, the website there from the top left corner. And again, the tech and the tech matrix is a little more concrete in terms of trying to help you figure out where are you along the continuum. There's a lot of categories, there's a lot of things, and um, even though when you blow those out into those cells, it gives you a little more detail, it's still fairly big. So my colleague, Julie Graber, and I have embarked on a quest to try and come up with something that's a little more concrete and a little more useful to principals and teachers as they think about and look at tech usage in the classroom. So we've been working on uh, a unit design template or maybe a classroom observation template for want of a better term. We've been calling it true to cop, you know, and I joke that it's like an apricot, only a little sweeter. And, um, you know, the goal that Julie and I have been working on is, is how do we create a walkthrough template or maybe a unit design or redesign template that really allows educators to assess tech integration within the context of higher order thinking skills and really important disciplinary concepts. So, you know, Peggy, as much as you love the Arizona Tech Integration Matrix, and that's good, I don't think it's detailed enough or concrete enough. So let me share a little bit about what Julie and I have come up with. This is version one. Um, we're soliciting feedback on this. We by no means claim that it is um, where it needs to be yet or that it's perfect. Um, but we think it's at least a little bit helpful. So here's where we're headed. Um, so the Trudicot has, I think, nine main sections, and we're trying to get at some big stuff, right? So uh, the first section is around individualization and personalization, and we have some very concrete questions, like who got to pick what's being learned, and who got to pick how it gets learned, and who got to pick how you demonstrate the knowledge and how it's assessed, and who got to pick which technologies you're using. And notice that those questions are very, very concrete and easily answerable by somebody who's walking into a classroom or who's looking at a unit before it's implemented. And the idea here is that these are the kinds of questions that you would ask to try and figure out things like what level of standard am I in? Or am I living in the sweet spot of the TPAC framework? Or which cell of the Arizona Tech Integration Matrix are we? So you're like, those frameworks don't have concrete enough questions to let you know, you know, I'm in this cell, or I'm in this circle, or I'm at this level, or whatever. And rather than trying to guess, because everybody has different criteria, or whatever, Julie and I said, well, why don't we just come up with the actual questions we would ask and want to know about, and just use those instead. So we're actually less concerned about what level are you in, or what intersection are you, or which cell do you belong in, or whatever. And we're really more interested in the answers to these very concrete questions like these. So this is our first set, and you kind of get a sense of what we're doing now. So let me just kind of walk you through the rest of this. Um, uh, Alexander asks, will I share this? And yes, I absolutely will share this. So um, I don't have a public version that I can throw up here right now, but um, at the end, I will say anybody who's participating today, you have my contact info, just send it to me, and then I'll, I'll get this back to you. Because I think you're going to want to see some more stuff from me other than just this. I hope at least. Okay. Um, 
So here's part B of the true to cut, but it's around agency and ownership. It kind of overlaps over the first part, so you know you may eventually blend these together. But you know who's got the primary? Who's the primary driver of the talk time? Who's not only doing most of the talking, but who gets to pick? Who gets to talk? Right? Um, and then again, who's who's driving the work time? Do students get to decide and drive the work time? Is it, are the teachers driving the work time? Both, whatever. Um, is that work reflecting the student interests or passions, or is it all just being directed by the teacher in the textbook and so on? Um, and uh, you know, who's their primary user of the tech? You know, so many of these tech lessons are are um, so teacher focused that students have ever get to touch the tech. You know, the teacher is doing most of the usage. Um, let's see, what else? Um, how that get in there? I don't know how that got in there. Hang on, Steve, my um, slides are now out of order. Way out of order. So this is stuff from the end. Part. Hang on one second. Yeah, because now I don't know which one it'll be. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Okay, Steve, I can do this. I'll, I'll uh, those slides starting with number one hundred are getting mixed in with ten. So um, I can't handle that. So hang on. <laughs> so we were on slide. Uh, so okay. So I think this one is the next one. Nope. Sometimes this happens. I'm going to fix no, it. No, 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 I got it. I got it. Okay. So um, I figured it out. No need. Um, so here's the, here's the next part. So around communication, right? Because we want to think about the four C's. So communication. So how are students communicating about themselves, pairs, triads, lots of groups? If they get to communicate with other people, with whom? Why right? do you get to use digital technology to communicate? And if so, what tools are you using? Right? So that's kind of the. Um, Communication piece. There's also a collaboration piece, which is more than just communicating. It's around co-working. It's around co-creating. And again, similar questions. How do you get to work with who? You know, on the inside of the school, outside of the school. What kind of tools do you get to use, and so on. Um, another part of the true decode is around authenticity. So we do so much fake work in school, right? We pretend, or we simulate, or we make these goofy word problems that kids don't care about. And what we're trying to get at is that. Is student work really reflective of that, of the kind of work of the real people outside of school? Does it make a contribution to that world outside of school? You know, those are all questions we can ask. Um, okay, let's see, there's the next one. Um, this is uh, a big important area for Julie, my colleague. She's talking about um, substantive content, right? So this idea that are we learning substantive content? And, and so is the content and, and procedures and other stuff that we're doing in class, is it really focused on what's important in the discipline? Is it, is it appropriate? And is it around big concepts, not just the minutia and the trivia? Um, and do students also get to sit in the role of uh, people who live in that discipline out in the real world, right? Do they get to use the same kind of practices and processes these tools and technologies in history class, for example, that a historian would. Can you get to use the same practice and processes, tools and technologies in science that a scientist would, and so on. So you get the idea. That's sort of what this section is meant to get at. Um, a couple more here. Uh, critical thinking, right? So you know, one of our other C's, creativity. Do students get to really do some deep thinking work? Do they get a chance to be creative? Do they get a chance to take initiative and be entrepreneurial? Are they doing reflection and metacognition? Uh, you know, like could a student tell you what they're learning, not just what they're doing, for example. Um, so there's some questions there around that. Um, technology, we had a couple technology specific um, questions that we wanted to get at, like is technology a means, not to, uh, a means, not an end? Is it really adding value above and beyond what we could do without it? Um, are we using the tools appropriately and meaningful for the task at hand and so on? And then finally, just some sort of overall assessment and alignment questions around, you know, do students get to create real world products and performances? Are we using technology to facilitate that assessment? Um, is everything aligned along the way and so on? So the goal of the True to Cut is, again, to try and help structure really concrete, specific questions around what you see in a classroom or a unit that gets designed and so on. So the best usage of the true cop is when you run it against existing lessons. So even though I'm not a humongous fan of the Arizona Tech Integration Matrix, I think it has some affordances, but there's, there's still a lot of vagueness in there. One of the things that the Tech Integration Matrix does have is it's have these wonderful little video, tape, uh, video lessons um, and lesson plans that go with them that you can show teachers or administrators. And so it's a really robust resource for that front. 
So what we will do, what Julie and I do, is that we'll sit down with a bunch of principals or superintendents or classroom teachers or whomever, and we'll pick a lesson, right? And we'll play the little video, and we'll send them to look at the lesson plan. And then what we do is we run it against the Trudicott questions, right? So the lesson plan has standards, and it tells you about the procedures and the materials and the objectives. So, you know, a lot of the information that's really builds out around a two-minute video that you see really helps you get a sense of what's there. But then we'll pick a section or two of the Trudicott, and we'll say, okay, so let's say that you are aiming for high levels of student agency and ownership in this lesson. Here are some questions you can ask about this lesson. Do you see them? Are they present? You know, how would you answer the questions? Maybe you're striving for a rich connection and communication and collaboration. And again, use that section of the Trudicott and run it against this lesson, run it against what you saw in the video. Is it there? Is it not? And then we talk about how do you make it better, right? What suggestions would you make for making it richer, deeper, whatever? And those are really wonderful conversations because now we have specific look for's that really seem to help teachers and administrators, and we have really concrete questions that we can ask that really get at exactly what we're seeing and exactly what we're trying to make happen. Um, so the Trudicott so far has been a pretty powerful tool for us, and even though it's in version one and we think it needs a lot of work, um, the kind of conversations that we're having are much richer and deeper and robust and concrete and specific even with fairly novice teachers and administrators than we've had before with those other frameworks. So I thought I'd just share that with you guys. Uh, if you guys have any questions about Trudicott, about how we're using it, whatever, now's a great time to throw them in the room. Um, otherwise, I'm going to navigate to my next slide and make sure that I'm uh, ready for part two, um, which is the main substance of what we're doing. But I thought I'd share sort of the tech integration piece um, because we're having a lot of success with it, and hopefully you will too. Okay, so we don't have a boatload of questions rolling in the, in the chat area. So I'm going to keep rolling, and I'll, and I'll keep an eye out in the bottom left corner for other stuff. Um, so the other thing I want to share with, I want to share this idea about what does it mean to really move a group of leaders forward when you have time with them. So I had this wonderful opportunity this year to work with the school district. And I get seven days with them between September and May, um, seven full days. Uh, so we meet about once a month. You know, I don't, don't think we met in December. I don't think we met in uh, March because it's spring break. Uh, but otherwise, I'm essentially with them once a month. Um, and so it's cool. They, you know, they have a number of schools. There's about 40 administrators on the leadership team between the building principals and assistant principals, the folks that are in the central office, the superintendent. I mean, and they've got everybody there. They've got the finance director, the HR director. I mean, everybody from the district is there. Um, they've got the head of the teachers union. I mean, it's a really sort of, you know, this is the leadership team of the district. And what we're doing is we are, um, trying to navigate, you know, what does a process look like that would take this group of, of administrators to a completely different place by the time we're done. Um, so um, I'm going to walk you through very quickly sort of the first five days, because that's how far we've gotten so far. We've got two days left, one in April and one in May. And again, throw your, throw your thoughts and questions up on the side. I'm going to pause after each day and see what kind of thoughts and, and, and reactions you have as we go. Uh, but think about if you had seven days with a group of leaders, and this is a district that was trying to be progressive, and you knew that everybody was at all kinds of different starting points, and you wanted to get them all to have this rich, robust vision of what powerful learning could look like, particularly, you know, if you also threw in the technology piece into the equation. So I have a co-facilitator. He's there in the district. Um, he's one of the central office folks, and he and I have been planning these days together. And so we decided since we have seven days to play with, um, we can go slow and we can go deep. And we can really make a big, rich experience for these folks over time, right? And one of the nice things about meeting once a month is it gives them time to think and reflect in between when we meet, which is awesome. So day one, uh, we decided to really focus on the big picture. You know, Simon Sinek reminds us that we should start with the why and not just the what and the how, but in other words, if you're not guided by a deep, deep, rich, strong vision and purpose that guides everything you do, then you're essentially just being busy. Um, so we started day one with a quick exercise that we actually stole from Pam Harian and Iris Okal, um, who are keynotes uh, from this conference as well. 
And uh, it's just a quick padlet where we say, describe a way that you think the innovation decade will change learning out of mind for young people. Give us a couple sentences. And so just sort of an initial take in terms of, you know, where are they? What are they thinking? What do they know already? And so on. Uh, and that was good. And it gave us the quick chance to realize that they're going to be interacting with the computers. They're going to be online. We're going to throw questions down. They're going to come back. And we're going to talk about it. So we did that real quick um, just to kind of see where folks were. Um, and then we grounded ourselves in some rules of play. And this is actually really important um, because we wanted to set a tone very early around what kind of interaction and behaviors and presence we wanted people to have during these days. And so, you know, we threw up a bunch of rules of play. We asked people to think about them. We, we changed a couple. We added some. And essentially, this is what we came up with as a list. And we sort of agreed as a group that when we're together, this is what it's going to look like. You know, these are, these are going to be how we interact with and, and, and be with each other for these seven days. And, and that has been really great because, um, as you'll see, we revisit those every single day um, that we meet, just to remind people about this is what we're all about and so on. Uh, so once we got that out of the way, then um, we asked them to, hang on, I've got a quick glitch here. Um, then we asked them to um, think about how our world is changing because of technology. And that um, was their initial take. Like, it didn't throw anything at them. We just, again, we're trying to find out where are they, what are they doing. And so they're working in groups of four or five. And you can see down at the bottom of the Google spreadsheet that each group has their own tab, which means that, you know, later in the exercise, they can go see what each other has done. So what they're doing is they're working on column A. And so I'm basically just trying to answer the question. Because of technology, our world today is more whatever. Right? And so I gave him a quick example like connected and then, you know, how you would take that word connected and then you would put two or three sentences after it to really blow it out in detail and have, so that somebody else could understand, can understand what you mean. So they worked on that column A for quite a while. In fact, they worked on column A for like, I don't know, almost an hour. Um, you know, because we're trying to go deep here, we have the time to play and we're not, you know, this is what they want to do in five, ten minutes. So they spent a lot of time on column A. And then what they did was then we had them start thinking about column B and column C. So you know, we took a break, we come back, and then we spent like another 45 minutes to an hour thinking about if you look at the things in column A, what are the implications for learning and teaching and schooling um, that are positive, like the positive implications. So they spent like another hour working on that, and then um, you can kind of see um, you know, they, were, they spent another 45 minutes an hour working on the negative part. So we really blew this out in detail, right, uh, about how has our world changed, how is technology impacting us in good ways and bad ways, and then what are the implications for how we learn? What are the implications for how we teach? What are the implications for how we structure school? Um, you know, by now we've kind of blew through lunch. We're on the other side of lunch now during the day. And we come back, and we're still talking about this stuff, and we're still – um, blown it up. So now what we've done is, is now I sent them to some other group's tab. I'm right? looking at what other groups have said and they're thinking about it and talking about it within their group. And they are um, selecting a couple key important things that they saw from another group and throwing them onto the summaries tab. And you can kind of see how people are doing different color codes and so on, where they're grabbing somebody else's stuff that they liked from their tab even though it wasn't from their own group, but somebody else's group. And then the third one, the summary tab, it says, we like this part that they talked about, we like this part. So we're creating this sort of master list of big ideas and, and that resonate with us as a group um, about how our world has changed, and both positive and negative. So all this has taken about, I don't know, 60% of the day so far. Um, and we're just spending this time, and they're spending the whole time actively discussing, they're talking in their small groups, they're seeing what each other's groups are doing by clicking on the different tabs. They're really blowing out this thinking in depth, right, which is what we want. We want them thinking, thinking, thinking at this day. This is day one. We're building the big picture. Um, after we do all that, then I spend a little time introducing a couple of resources from my website and from my blog. So I talk about how when I think about all that stuff, that's in that spreadsheet that they did before, and I kind of combine it into three main categories. That, that sort of three big shifts that I think schools need to make. The shift from low-level thinking to high-level thinking, 
deeper, more cognitively complex work by students. Uh, the shift from teacher directed to student agency, right? How do we get students to have greater ownership and control over more of their learning? And then finally, making that shift from analog to digital, particularly because, not just because it's a digital world out there, but because these digital tools help facilitate those other two shifts, the shifts towards higher level thinking and towards student agency, right? So we talked about that a little bit, and then I also just went over them with them fairly quickly, what I call, you know, sort of eight building blocks right now for the future of schools. These are movements that we're currently seeing that are rising in pockets and are getting attention as they start to grow. Um, that seem to point towards very different kinds of learning environments for students, right? And particularly when you start adding them up. So, you know, we've got schools and districts and classrooms that are playing around with project-based and inquiry-based learning spaces, or we've got places that are working on uh, how do we have students do more authentic real-world work. You know, we've got folks playing around with competency-based education and standards-based grading, lots of places trying to go one-to-one. -one. Um, there's the whole open access and open educational resources movements, uh, these online communities of interest, what we would call PLNs, perhaps. Um, this whole adaptive learning software and data systems that are out there that are claiming to individualize through the learning. Um, alternative credentialing that's happening that's sort of undercutting traditional degree and diploma uh, functions of schools and universities. And, and those building blocks are coming together in new ways to create very different kinds of, of learning systems. So we'll kind of go over that real quick with the folks. And then we talk about, so how do we pull all this together into some kind of meaningful vision, right? Like we spent most of the day talking about how the world is changing, and not just changing in a generic sense for us as citizens and people who are, you know, live on the web and whatever, but the implications for schools and classrooms and kids and teachers, and, and how do you pull that together into some kind of vision? So I show them... Um, a couple of different examples, like this vision video from the Farmington Spring Lake School Systems in Minnesota. So we watched that to see what their take on creating that vision was. We look at the vision from uh, the Digital Media Research Hub, the Connected Learning Infographic that talks about another vision around you know, what does powerful learning look like and so on. Um, and then, you know, we're talking. We're talking the whole time about what do you see, how is this different, so on. Then I throw them into a self-assessment. So we're nearing the end of the day. Uh, it's about mid-afternoon, and I said, all right, all this stuff that we're talking about. Now, let's kind of talk about where we are. Right? We talked about how the world is out there that's changed, how schools and learning systems are changing. Now, let's talk about where we are presently with all of this. And again, still trying to build that big picture vision for these leaders. So we take Will Richardson's characteristics of bold schools, right, and I turn them into a survey. Um, and then we add to that some other sort of questions that I want to throw in there um, that get at concrete practices or the presence of certain things, like, you know, do our students get to frequently collaborate online? Uh, are we using technology to try and facilitate individualized learning experiences? Do we teach our students empowered use of the Internet or just safe and appropriate use? Um, you know, when we teach students writing, what does that look like? You know, we've got online courses going on. I mean, there's just lots of some specific questions there's about 18 of them that we tack on to Will's bold schools criteria. And then we look at the results, right? And so here's the results. You can see that the stuff at the top is the stuff they're doing the least, the stuff as you start moving toward the bottom, the stuff they're doing more, right? And so um, notice that the district thought that they were a little more learning-centered than everything else, but still not really strong and robust. You know, on a scale of one to four, they're barely averaging two. That's by their own assessment as leaders, which is sort of interesting. Um, and some of the concrete items to start looking around, you know, you can see that, you know, nobody's taking online courses. Um, students are not frequent and regular online collaborators. They're not really doing much differentiation with technology and so on. So, again, now we're building a baseline, right? We're building a baseline of, of how the world is changing and how we are not really responding so much uh, as an institution here. And we're coming up to a shared understanding of what that looks like and so on. Um, and then we sort of head toward the end of the day and we start talking about things like, what's getting in the way of us doing this, right? And so we do a pilot, we have them throw up some, some initial ideas about blockers and barriers and challenges that are stepping in their way. And we talk about that a little bit. And then finally, uh, because we're also trying to get them connected, because most of these people are not in connected spaces, we take a pause from all that big, deep thinking that we've done all day. And we spend the, the end of the day talking about um, how do we start creating a community within ourselves that really moves us, that allows us to start 
understanding how to use social networks in powerful ways. So we start with an intra-district Google Plus community, and that's what we do on this day is we teach them how to do Google Plus, and we get that set up, and we get them into that community, and they practice posting and so on. And we also do a little bit of metacognitive reflection on all the other tools they've used already during the day, like Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets, and we've used Today's Meet and, and, and online survey software and Google Forms and Padlet, and just to recognize that we didn't really instruct them in any of that. It was all kind of seamless. Um, and that it was, you know, it was a means, not the end, and that they didn't really even notice that they were using all those different tools, and yet they used them quite fluently without any much direct instruction. Um, and that's really day one. So, you know, evaluations for that day were really strong. Those red numbers across the top on the, are on a scale of one to five, with five being excellent. Um, and so you can see that they walked away from day one very overwhelmed, but very grateful to have the, the chance to talk deeply and think deeply um, about stuff that they usually don't have an option to spend time on. So before I head into day two and show you where we went next, uh, does anybody have any thoughts or questions or reactions? Our conversation space is very quiet right now. It might be because you're bored to death. It might be because I'm moving really fast. It uh, might be who knows. Um, but thoughts, questions, reactions, those in the conversation space, uh, whatever's in your heads. Like I said, this is a behind the curtains look at how we're working with one district to move their entire leadership team forward around powerful visions of learning, powerful uses of technology, and so on. Um, so that's day one, right, the big picture. So now what the plan is, we've got six more days. <laughs> Everybody's like, got me thinking, good, that's what I'm going for. Um, so now that we've got sort of the big picture, we've got at least a decent grounding in that. I'm coming back, you know, four weeks later or so, and we start blowing out some of those ideas in more detail, right? So one of the things that emerged from that early spreadsheet discussion is that one of the powerful themes of today's world is that we're more connected, right? And that it's that we have powerful collaboration opportunities. So we, so we take day two and we say, let's really talk about what it means to be connected and to be collaborative with digital technologies. So we start day two again uh, we, with an overview of the day. We tell them what we're going to do. We go over the rules of play again, so we're all grounded in what we decided. And notice that we also remind them that the evaluation results are public and that they can see what each other felt and thought about and reacted to from last time. And so we're standing behind a vision of transparency here around results, right? Like we're holding ourselves publicly accountable for the results we're getting with this group and saying that whether it goes well or it doesn't, you will know. You will know. And, and that we will be very responsive to whatever you tell us. And we're, we're so willing to stand behind the quality of our work here that we're willing to make those results public to everybody who's in these workshops and, and so on. Um, and, and that sends a pretty strong message to folks that you're really trying to serve them and serve them well, right? So we go over the day again. Uh, we remind them about the three big shifts, the eight building blocks that are there. Um, and then you can see under that 805 slot that we sort of show them what we're talking about today, but what the next few topics are going to be, right? So we did the big picture stuff. Now, this time, we're going to talk about connecting and collaborating. Next time, we're going to talk about project and inquiry-based learning. And next time, we're going to talk about effective tech integration. You get the idea, right? So the theme for the day is connecting and collaborating. So we dive right in with some stuff around being connected. Uh, and what does that mean? So we showed them the Chris Anderson video around how web video drives innovation. They love that. We showed them Stephen Johnson's video around where good ideas come from and you know, this idea that chance favors the connected mind. They love that. Um, I share a few things from the book, The Power of Pull, about how responsive organizations have people living at the edges that pull great ideas in from other edges of other organizations and pull those ideas into the center and so the center push, pushing ideas in afterwards. Um, Jonathan, yes, uh, slides will be able to recording afterward and we'll also, I'll give you a contact link to whatever you need from me. Um, so we share all that and then um, we kind of ask them, okay, at this point you've seen some really powerful things around connection and the power of connection, what's in your heads right now, right? So we throw up a padlet, they give their responses, it's all good. Um, and, you know, and you can see their reactions a little bit about what that looks like. But then we go old school, and this is a super fun activity. Um, so we hand them sheets of one white paper, and we give them a black pen and a blue pen. So everybody has one sheet of paper and two pens, and we say, 
how are you connected to the world around you, to ideas, to individuals, to groups, to organizations. And what we're going to do first is we're going to say we want you to draw your connections in black, right? So what are your analog connections? So using the black pen, you know, draw how you're connected, you know, by mail and, and the telephone, when you meet face-to-face -face for work and you go to a church function or a neighborhood gathering or a community group or you read books or you go face-to-face -face to a conference or what else, right? But what are your analog connections to ideas, individuals, groups, and organizations? So they actually draw that on the piece of paper. And I couldn't find my folder to have the images or I would put a sample one up here so you could see it. Because then we have them go back and they do the same thing, but digital, right, with the blue pen. Say so now, add to this your connections to outside ideas, individuals, groups, organizations, and so on in blue that are digital. So it might be texting or email or instant messaging. You've got blogs and social networks. Maybe you connect with or Skype with somebody. Um, you're reading web pages. You're watching webinars or whatever. What do those connections look like? And they draw those out in blue. And then they share them in the group with each other. And that was just fascinating, right? Because everybody's diagram was completely different. And some of them had a ton of black and no blue. And some of them had a ton of blue and no black. And others are more like, I had no idea until I drew it how connected I was, right? Or I'm like, I'm connected to nobody. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm in isolation. Or whatever. I'm like, the conversation was just fascinating. It was really fun. So we took all those diagrams and we scanned them. And, and it was just good for them to, you know, they had the sheet of paper to look at it like, this is my connected world, analog and digital, all in one place. It was really super fun. Okay, so after we did that, then um, we talked about what are the implications of, of, of our analyses. We thought about everything we did, and we say, what are the implications for ourselves? You know, as we think about our diagrams, what does that mean for us? And then we also had them talk about what does it mean for staff? you know, our faculty and teachers and other folks, and then what does it mean for our students? Um, and so we had some really rich, robust conversations around that, and that was all super fun. Um, and so by this time it's around 9.30, we've, we've been meeting for about an hour and a half or so for the day, and so then what we do is we slide them into this exercise where we say, all right, let's look at some communities of interest that are online. Right, because there's lots and lots of different ways and ideas that people are coming together around. So what I did was I went to Wikipedia and I looked up something like online communities or something and it had a letter ranking, like the biggest ones, you know, and I went through and I picked different online communities that had the most users. And, you know, the diversity is fascinating, right? So if you look at the list that's on the screen right now, it's everything from, um, people who care about Pokemon or Glee fans to, you know, people who are into fetishes, number 11, Fet Life, that one's probably not one you should click on at work. Um, you know, there's farmers only groups, there's people around, you know, U.S. Army collaborations, uh, artists, uh, book readers, uh, people who make Lego movies out of Lego pieces. I mean, there's just all kinds of different communities that are floating around out there. So we just gave them a whole bunch of time, like, you know, 40 minutes or so to just start exploring. So click on the link, see what's there, see how they're sharing and connecting with each other, what they're talking about. And it just got a really rich sense of the, of the robust diversity of how they live, how people are connecting you know, online together. Um, and they like that a lot. Um, and then we talked about that. And then what we did is, is um, we sent them back. Oh, uh, wait a minute. So that's... Mm -hmm. Let me skip a slide somewhere. Um, yeah, okay, so I got one out of order. I'm sorry. So then we did the same thing for students. We said, all right, so we were thinking about how those of us adults out in the real world connect and collaborate. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a gallery walk to um, do the same thing, but talk about different ways that students are collaborating and connecting online. Right? So not just adults out in the real world, but actual classrooms, actual kids, actually teachers getting connected, um, and so on. And so the way we did that was we set up each one of these um, on different stations around the room. So they all had their laptops. So it was like, okay, so you're number one, you're number two, you're number three. So everybody pulled up their one resource. And because they did a lot of sitting from day one and complained about it, we got them up. And what they did is they had two or to two and a half minutes at each station. So they would get up and they would go to station one, and that group of like two or three leaders 
would sit for two minutes and they would look at the Taking IT Global site and they would explore it and so on and then they'd go back to the starting page and they'd get up and they would travel, physically travel to the next computer and look at Oak Ridge Reads for a couple minutes and then get up and physically travel to Youth Voices and you get the idea. Right, so they did a gallery walk all around the room, but in all these different stations and all these different examples of students collaborating. And, and again, they're starting to see that just like we as adults through the rich, robust communities, so too are students. Um, so we did all that, and that was super fun. And then, you know, lots of reflection about implications for, you know, learning and teaching in schools and what this was like for them. Um, and then, um, let's see, this is not in order, so let's see. Um, Yelda. So after we did that, then we, oh, yes, it is in order. Okay. And then I made a mistake. So then I had this afternoon, and we're supposed to be talking about connecting and collaborating, and I did a bird walk. And in reflection, I should have done this later in the sequence. Um, but the idea was to start doing a little teaser around tech integration. Like we haven't really talked about powerful tech integration, but my thinking in my head at the time was, so you've seen all these uses in the morning of kids doing connective and collaborative projects. Now let's see how you think about them, right? So we threw them against the mystery Skype. So they just had a project description. They watched a little video, uh, some more of the description, and then they watched a video of a classroom actually engaged in the mystery Skype project, right? And then I just asked them, is this any good or not? And like, you know, is this, uh, you know, powerful use of technology or whatever? And I didn't give any feedback. Like I wouldn't tell them, was it good or wasn't it? Like from my head. You know, I wanted to just kind of think about it and talk about it. And, and, and yeah, thinking at the time was that this was a natural extension of what we done this morning about people connecting. But it turns out that it actually was a bird walk that should have been saved for later. I'll explain why uh, in a minute. So, so we talked about Mystery Skype um, in the afternoon and didn't give them much feedback on their thoughts. Kind of left them hanging, right, and deliberately on my part. Um, but I think the timing could have been better later. Um, and then finally, we got to day two with that tool usage again in terms of thinking about, okay, so last time we exposed you to a Google Plus community inside, now it's like getting you connected to Twitter as a learning tool and so on. Um, Gordon, this is a school district that's about half one-to-one. -one. The upper grades are one-to-one. -one, the lower grades are moving that direction. They have, um, I don't know, around a dozen buildings or so. I think that's right. Uh, we've got about 40 people in the leadership team that we're working with. Um, so that's the end of day two. Everybody's happy. Again, the results are good and so on. So we head into day three, and now we're talking about problem and inquiry based learning, another lens on the big picture stuff. And again, we start with an overview of the rules of play, what we're going to do that day. We go over the last session's evaluations, just to remind them that we're living publicly, remind them of the sequence of the days and what's, what we're doing today and what we're doing next and so on. And then, of course, I'm like, hey, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about with the connecting and collaborating, and it's this whole idea of crowdsourcing, right? So we go through a whole bunch of crowdsourcing examples like we did the previous meeting, except this time it's simply like connecting around like crowdsourcing. Uh, and we looked at some different examples, and I share things like Creative Commons and Star Wars Uncut and the Math Movie Network, and you know, just a bunch of examples of, of crowdsourcing in action. Um, and then we did a, about a half hour walkthrough of Wikipedia so they really understand how Wikipedia works because there's a lot of misinformation about this idea that crowdsourcing can't result in quality, that instead it just results in stupid crap. Uh, so we did all that uh, as part of the crowdsourcing. And of course, that would have been much better in the afternoon of day two than, than the mystery Skype leave them hanging for later thing I did. And I should have moved that to, you know, the end of this day because there have been a great lead-in for day four when we actually talked about powerful tech integration. So I put those in the wrong spot. Um, so I will flip those next time. But anyway, so we went through a lot of examples of crowdsourcing and really wrapped our head around that concept like we had done around powerful collaboration and connection. Um, and then, you know, we spent a few minutes talking about, so what could you do with crowdsourcing? Like what could your students and teachers do in a crowdsourced way that would create benefit for themselves and for others. You know, to what outside projects could they contribute, what things could they could they make themselves? And each group had the task of coming up with five great ideas and then identifying their favorite idea from another group. So we did that. Um, that was fun. Then we slid over into problem-based learning. And we started with a grounding, we had actually asked them to read this like four-page article ahead of time called The Eight Essentials for Problem-Based Learning. Right, it looks like this, it's from the Buck Institute, it's from uh, ASCD. 
And so they had read that, so now they come in with a basic grounding and understanding of, of the essential concepts of PBL. And then I went through some examples of what PBL is not, right, like shoebox floats or, um, you know, Chinese dynasty pagodas where you basically glue facts onto the side of cardboard things. It's like, you know, this is not project based on it. It might be a project, but it's not PBL. Um, and then we had them look at a couple of examples of supposed examples of PBL online, and they said, run these against you know, sort of this idea of project versus PBL. Is it a project or is it PBL? And so we talked about that a little bit. Then we, again, we're trying to get them to really think deeply about what is good PBL they look like. So we had them pick an example. So we gave them a whole list. So there's like five elementary examples. There's like five middle school examples. They could pick whichever one they wanted. And when they went in there, there was a really rich, deep description of a project. And then we had them analyze it as a group. Um, so Matthew, I want to see the question because what was the of uh, participants? So I think you're missing a word in there somewhere. So they're looking at these projects in depth, and what they're doing is they're trying to analyze it against the eight essential elements of PBL. So you can see the elements are down on the left side, and then they're typing over on the right, what evidence did we see within this project description for the thing on the left, right? So did this project have significant content? Here's the evidence, or lack thereof. And we're talking about it in the right-hand cell. Did this project have a driving question? And if so, what does it look like? What was it? You know, so the typing. So they're they're going into some analysis here. We've got about 40 people here, um, you know, going through this stuff together in groups of four or five. Um, after we've done that in-depth analysis, we dropped back and again talked about how is this different from what we normally do in our classes. Um, so we had some pretty rich, deep discussions around that. Um, and then, again, we went even deeper again. We picked yet another project. So, and we noticed that we're re-looping, we're extending, we're, we're revisiting, we're, we're trying to get them deeply grounded in the stuff that's important here. So pick a project like the Rock and Mineral Machine poster with, you know, and read the description, see the sample of products, and so on. And then, again, run the analysis. Is it deep? Does it have a deep driving question? Does it have a need to know? Answer some questions around it. So we're spending more and more time on it. Going even deeper, now we've got a case study. So we'll remind them one more time after lunch. This is what PBL is all about. And then, right, we watch this, you know, it's like a nine-minute video of an elementary PBL project. And then again, they run it again against the eight elements. We're trying to give them practice, immersive practice about how do I think about this stuff? How do I do this stuff? And so on. Um, and then we wrap up with a tablet. You know, what are our takeaways and our big ideas? As we, as we get away from this stuff. Um, so we're always trying to make sense about it. And then we close with our tool for the day, which in this time was blog readers and Feedly, and trying to get them connected to some folks. And one more time, the evaluations are pretty strong. Okay. A4 actually goes fast, in case you're worried, um, where we go about critical thinking and tech integration. Again, we're trying to blow out the things from day one in more detail, all the stuff that we go over at the beginning. Uh, my co-facilitator starts off in the morning with some discussions on critical thinking. We read the poem, The Road Not Taken, and then we answer a bunch of questions about it, and we realize that it doesn't actually mean what most people think it means, which is kind of fun. We read the article by Grant Wiggins about a lack of thinking and thinking about a lack of thinking. We spend some time discussing what thoughtfulness is versus what mental tasks are, and that was a good conversation. And then we also talk about how does this manifest in schools? So what is really thoughtful? Um, thinking, you know, what does thoughtful thinking look like in learning, and then what are examples of mental tasks, simple mental tasks in learning. Um, so we did that kind of stuff. Uh, we closed with a little discussion of Aaron Iba and his psychological profile, which is probably posted online that, you know, reminds us that just because kids aren't complying with their mental task assignments doesn't mean they're not capable of, of deep, thoughtful learning. Um, we spent a little more time talking about memorization versus learning and that concept, so we spent some time discussing that and having rich discussions um, in each group around there, you know, and is memorization important, is it not? Again, we're thinking about critical thinking, we're thinking about what does it really mean to learn versus memorizing, we're having these discussions in the morning. What are the characteristics of the thinking classroom, both core and then secondary, what would you see, for example, when you walk in if you were looking for a thinking classroom? And then we slide into tech integration, and we're building right off this critical thinking idea and this project-based learning idea that we did before, and we said, all right, now let's think about powerful tech integration. If we really want powerful tech integration to occur, 
what are the kind of things that we're going to be looking for? And now we've relooped and we start heading into the Trudicot. So all that Trudicot stuff that I talked about at the beginning, this is where we start pulling that in. So we talk about TPAC, we talk about SAMR, we talk about digital blooms and the tech integration matrix, we talk about what they're good for, what they're not. We actually have them look at video lessons using those frameworks and try to give advice to teachers based on the framework. You know, so the group that has TPAC says, well, I watched that lesson and I read the lesson plan I use the TPAC framework and I don't have anything in the TPAC framework to give you advice from because there's no specificity in the TPAC framework that lets me have a concrete conversation with you about what I just saw. You know, so they come to those realizations and then we introduce to the top, same way that I did at the beginning about it's a work in progress, but it's meant to try and get a more concrete conversations. And then we spend the entire rest of the day looking at video lessons and analyzing and thinking about them and talking about them and um, going in deep about, you know, if you want greater agency, if you want greater connection and collaboration, or if you're focusing on substantive content or what, you know, whatever you're looking for, you know, this, here's how you think about it, talk about it, dissect it, and so on. So just over and over again, like I showed you at the, at the beginning of this presentation, how do we cut through these lessons, dissect them, and so on. Now, the last part of the day is really fun, is that then we flip. Instead of just simply analyzing and critiquing, what something that somebody's already made, we put them in the mode of designer. Now it's your chance to design up front, right, rather than dissecting something afterwards, which is a very different stance on the same issue. So what I do is we give them some science standards and also a writing standard and a speaking listening standard, you know. So these are actually from the Iowa core, so they're pretty similar to the common core. And we say, so these are your constraints, right? Like you have to create a powerful unit or set of lessons that addresses these science standards, these writing standards, these speaking listening standards, and then we also gave them a tool that they had to somehow incorporate into the lesson, like they had one specific tool that they had to get into. Um, so let me pull that up, because now we're at number one again. Um, there we go. Um, so standards, you know, in this case, the group had to use screencasts somewhere in their project or unit. They had to build team press into that. And then they had to start talking about what's your objective going to be, what are your procedures going to be. And so we give them like an hour um, to um, hack out as a group what the lesson is. And we tell them that they're going to spend some time at the end with another team going over what they've designed. So they spend about an hour designing a powerful unit right, that's, that's deep and robust. They use the true to cop, they use the PBL guidelines, they use those other frameworks that they have available to them, use whatever they can to make this powerful unit um, based, that incorporates these standards and, and these tools. And then they spend about 10 minutes sharing and getting feedback from another group and then vice versa. So they do all that and, they, you know, with the idea of making it better. So just like they're dissecting somebody else's lessons, now they're dissecting their own from, an, you know, another group in the room. And that's really fun. Um, so, you know, here's another example. Um, of another group, these guys had to do with human body systems and different writing standards, and they had to do voice thread and, and the kind of stuff that they came up with and so on. So putting them in a designer role is very different than dissecting somebody else's. And so then we did some reflection around what was this like for you as a leader, right? What was this process like for you? And they say, oh, it was challenging, it was overwhelming, it made me anxious. It was kind of creative and fun. I was really about to have a team, but it felt inadequate to the task and so on, right? And we said, this is exactly the role you're putting your teachers in, right? When you're asking your teachers to create these kind of robust, powerful units, they're going to feel exactly like you just did, right? So you just live their role, and you better be cognizant and reflective on that as you ask them to do this kind of work. Um, so just putting them in the places somewhere else is really good. Um, so that's kind of how we wrapped up that day. Again, everybody's happy. The assessment scores, the value scores are, are cruising right along. And so then we head back into day five and decided to go back and revisit this concept of digital and what are the affordances that go with it. And so my co-facilitator again leads the morning and we start with the New York Times function around Snowfall, at the report on Snowfall at Tunnel Creek, which is a very rich multimedia news story about an avalanche. And, and um, so it's got text and it's got uh, videos and it's got interactive uh, motion activated, user generated maps and, and all kinds of cool stuff, right? And then they reflect on how is this similar to what we can accomplish in analog environments? How is this unique or different? So they're really starting to see the power of digital over analog. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, a love story, 22 pictures, and, and again, this heartwarming story of this, this vet 
uh, is an amputee and has a love story with his with his girl. And again, what what a sort of statistics it'll give you. We spend more time talking about digital versus analog. Back to the New York Times and just interactive, you know, activity that the New York Times is creating with some of its stories. We watch videos from a humanities professor that talks about how humanities work is changing dramatically in terms of how you present information and and, and analyze and, and do your work. Um, they were, they're reflecting all the time about how this is all going and so on, right, about how it was different. Uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about transmedia and the idea that stories can live across platforms in different locations and so on. Um, and then and then I throw them for a total loop. Is we slide to this idea of blended learning, this idea that technology is facilitating different kinds of learning environments, right? And before instead of digital, and we can now do learning differently, and that you know, it can change how we do time and place, path and pace. You know, we go through several different definitions of blended learning. We look at different kinds of videos that explain what blended learning is, right? So they're watching stuff from blended learning now and new classrooms. And, you know, it's just, you know, they're all touting the power of blended learning and, and how it's going to be so awesome. Um, we talk about, you know, the, the advantages for students, the advantages for teachers, all the good stuff that blended learning can do. Uh, we expose them to different models of blended learning, right, because there are different ways to blend learning with technology. So we do all of that. Um, and then we put them back into groups and we say, all right, you're going to pick one model of blended learning, let's say a lab rotation or a flex model or, you know, flipped classroom or whatever, and you're going to go in depth. So you click on your link for the group and you get a basic definition of what your model is. Um, you get some examples, some diagrams that help explain what your model looks like and how it works. And then you get links to schools that are actually doing it, right? And so you get descriptions um, uh, of different schools that are doing the write-ups and profiles of schools that are operating this manner. So that was the lab rotation model. You know, here's another example for the flex model. It's a definition. You get a drawing that shows you how it works. You get links to different schools that are doing that. And their job was to go immerse themselves in these models and really understand how they work, right? Because then what happens is that after lunch, um, you know, they've been thinking about these key questions for their model. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What would we need to put in place to implement this? If we wanted to do this, how hard or easy would it be? When might it be useful or appropriate? When might it not be right for us? And so on. And then they come back after lunch and they share with each other how their model works. We talk about them and so on. And by now they're really unhappy because what they realize is that most of the rhetoric around blended learning is around low-level learning. It's around Factual recall, it's around procedural regurgitation, and it's how do we use technology systems to facilitate that quicker and easier and better and faster. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Like, we just spent the last four days talking about rich, powerful, deeper thinking work, and all these blended learning models are around low-level thinking work, and there's a disconnect here. And, like, they're trying not to offend me. They're trying, you know, like, to go along because, you know, I've earned their trust and whatever, but they're really unsettled at this point, because I just presented all this stuff and they're looking at it as if it's all great. And then we have a discussion around what does it really mean to be personalized? What does it really mean to be individualized? What does it mean to really do deep thinking work, personalized, not just individualized with the technology marches you down the factor model? So, you know, we watch videos from Van Wilcox, we look at um, just the right writing around what does it really mean to be personalized. We look at um, you know pedagogy versus pedagogy. We look at Ray McClaskey's model of personalization versus individualization. And by now we're starting to breathe easier because they realize that oh, you know Scott's talking about stuff from Peter Pappas and how do we negotiate student-centered learning. And I'm feeling better now because he's bringing us back to this idea that we're looking for powerful, robust learning, not low-level learning facilitated by technology. And so they're breathing easy. And that was a really fun experience because it forced them to really think critically about what do we really think about what these people are pushing out at us, these vendors and these policymakers, and what's just what we really want. Um, and, and Scott left us hanging for a while, but then he brought us back and showed us how to make, make sense of that and so on. We close the day with a scenario. We say that imagine that a group of teachers comes to you with a project idea around life cycles of insects, right? And they're going to make an electronic book. And they've got all these plans. And, you know, here's the learning targets for this electronic book for these second graders. And here's what examples might look like and so on. And now based on everything we've talked about for the last five days, 
what kind of questions are you asked? What kind of advice are you going to give these teachers? What kind of feedback are you going to give? What kind of things are you going to do to prompt them to make it better, to make it deeper, make it richer? Because you spent all this time being immersed in this. And so that's how we close day five, right? And you can see some of the examples that we talked about, the kinds of things that they would ask their teachers, the things that they would talk about, and so on. So and again, evaluations were, were, were solved. So that's the first five days. And you can see that what we're trying to do is we're trying to take leaders from often very basic starting points. And over the course of five days, we're able to develop very rich, thick, deep understanding of what it means to do powerful learning with tech and to really articulate what does it look like, what do we look for, uh, and so on. We've got two days left, and that's where we are. Any other thoughts or questions as we in our last minute? You guys have been very quiet. Hopefully, we can give you a lot to think about. Um, so, as promised, here's my contact info, so which I'll leave on the screen. Um, you know, whatever parts of this you want, you know, this is all recorded. You can go back and watch it again. Uh, whatever parts of this you're interested in or watch, just give me, drop me a note, you know, on Twitter or email or whatever, and um, we'll send it your way. Okay. Scott, that was amazing. I have uh, put the slides in the oh, yeah. order. And so you can Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. You can download the slides if you'd like. Go to File, Save, and Save the Whiteboard. We should be in the correct order. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody. The other yeah. sessions are starting. Okay. Bye, guys. Oh,